Okay, we wait a little while. I don't remember to put on my headphone. Hi, Tung Liu, I see you there. You have a nice background for your scenery. Is that in Hangzhou or someplace in China? Good morning, Professor. Good morning. I see you have a nice background in your picture. It's a, it's a summer palace uh, in Beijing. Oh, summer palace, okay. Yeah. It's nice. I've, I'm grading the take home exam and I'm grading problem two. You did very well on problem two. Problem two is about is about what <laughs> I forgot the the problem screen. two is about uh, magnetic current, magnetic charges. Ah, okay. Solution. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, so you have had uh, electromagnetics before? I did. I did. Yes. UCLA. Yes. Who taught the course when you took that course at UCLA? I'm not sure. I, I think you, you, you know him. I think it's a professor, uh, uh, Yaya Ramatsami. Oh, yeah, Yaya Ramatsami. So he taught the graduate course then? Yeah, yeah. Okay, he's a good guy. <laughs> Very active. Oh, he is, yes. Yeah. And, uh... So what do you plan to get out of this course since you already know so much? Um. Well, just to you know, review. Oh, okay. At, at, at the same time, because uh, I saw that you also use uh, 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 Professor Kong's uh, textbook. Actually, I'm reading it while while taking the course. Oh, okay. But that 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 was a uh, that that's a fantastic textbook. Yeah, lots of materials in there. Maybe too difficult to digest on first reading. I think my lecture notes are easier to read. Hi, Jonathan. Good morning. I think Professor Kong's textbook is quite difficult to read on first reading. Yeah, yeah, it may but take some time to digest. Read my lecture notes first, and then you can use Professor Kong's book as a reference in the future if you want to read uh, things in greater depth. Because it's usually quite difficult to digest so much information on first reading. Right, right. Okay, so I guess uh, time is up and I better get started. Good morning, everybody. So hopefully by this afternoon, we will have to take home exam graded. I have already graded my part. Uh, the other teaching team is going to grade problem one and problem three. And I, 
graded problem two and you should be able to see the results of my grading from Brightspace if you want to look at uh, how you did for problem two. Okay. So let me share the screen first. Um, and then share the PPT slides. Let me move this away. Let me move this to the bottom, okay? And uh, today we are going to talk about uh, multi-junction transmission lines and duality principle. You saw a bit of the uh, duality principle in your take-home exam, but very little. We will start with multi-junction transmission lines, uh, beginning with single junction transmission line followed by two junction. We talk a little bit about straight capacitances and inductances, duality principle and so on. Transmission lines are very important because uh, they give you an intuitive feeling as to how wave propagates on a waveguide. A waveguide is a harder subject to study. Uh, you will study that later on uh, after this part of the course. Uh, but transmission lines give you the feeling that you can send a wave. For instance, you can send a wave on two conductors. This is the coax. It's uh, inner and con uh, outer conductor. A wave travels on it, and opti fi optical fiber is another example of a waveguide. So it's a microwave waveguide, which you have a pipe. A pipe can guide a microwave in it. And then you have different kinds of microstrip lines, which are very popular for guiding waves. The electrical power line is, in a sense, a kind of transmission line. So is when you have very low frequency electromagnetics or electrical engineering, you can use twist, uh, twisted pairs. Twisted pairs uh, form transmission lines of different kinds. What is more amazing is that because of this, you can actually concatenate transmission lines of different sizes, different characteristic impedances, and come up with some very complicated integrated circuits. And this is the microwave integrated circuit called MIC in short. It essentially consists of waveguides of different nature, maybe together with some transistors at these junctions and so on. You can make very, very wonderful technology out of this MIC. Another one is called MMIC, which stands for monolithic microwave integrated circuit. That make things even smaller. What you can see is quite large here. MMIC is something that is made even smaller. So let's see the math and the physics behind this. So in order to understand transmission line junctions, uh, how we can concatenate two waveguides together, uh, we look at this very simple problem of two waveguides with one single junction and in, uh, in between them we assume that line two is infinitely long. So that if you send a wave on line two, it will just travel forever to the right and never, never come back. So it goes to some never, never land and never return. So this is like a matched load. This is as if you have a matched load on this transmission line. We know that when you have a matched load, you send in the wave, the reflection coefficient is zero, okay? Again, if this is a transmission line, every point on this line has an impedance, which we call the generalized impedance. I think we call it uh, Z of Z. Okay, we have that impedance. Uh, that impedance is sort of the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Let me unfold this so that it's easier for me to write. Okay, so it is uh, like uh, one plus gamma Z over one minus gamma Z, if you remember the formula. Okay, so there's always an impedance associated with every point in space in a transmission line given by this formula, 
And there is a generalized reflection coefficient, which is the ratio of the reflected wave to the incident wave or right traveling wave or left traveling wave to the right traveling wave at every junction. And over here, we will see an impedance. If you look this way, okay, you will see an impedance and that impedance can be calculated using this formula. And hence you can replace this infinitely long transmission line with just a load impedance at this point. This complicated problem that you see in top figure can be replaced by a simpler figure at the bottom. And you know how to find the input impedance looking at this end because we already have derived the formula for that. Given the transmission line with the load at the end, you can always find the input impedance uh, at this uh, using that usual formula again. The usual formula being that, um, well, let me write it on the next page. That the input impedance that you see at location one over here is going to be the characteristic impedance of the line in wall, which is C0 plus one plus gamma, one minus gamma at this location L, okay, at this location. It has to be at that location, okay. At that location is where you have a gamma. And once you know that gamma at that location, you can find the corresponding impedance there. And that gamma is the function of distance. Okay, you can say that it's related to the gamma at the load end, e to the minus two j beta l. Okay, that we derived before. And once you plug it in there, uh, you can find z in one. Okay, so, so if you can find z in one, then um, you can even use this concept to solve even more complicated problems, okay? More complicated problems looking like this. What happens if you have a two junction transmission line? Uh, you can repeat this concept that once I know the load here, I can use my transmission line formula perhaps this one over here, to find the input, the input impedance at this junction. And once I know the input impedance at this junction, I can use this formula repeatedly to find the input impedance at this junction over here, okay? So you can actually uh, work this recursively and say that Z in two would be equal to, uh, Z02 First, let me look for the input impedance at the first junction. It will be Z02, the characteristic impedance of line two times one plus gamma L2 e to the minus two J beta two L. I have to be careful what beta I use because the beta for every transmission line is different. Okay, where well, L is the length of the first line. Okay, L, uh, this should be L2. Can everybody see that Z in two, the input impedance at this point should be given by this formula over here. Let me write my gamma properly. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, so if you can see that, that's wonderful. So if you know the input impedance at this point, uh, you can work out the input impedance at Z in one uh, quite easily using that formula above, okay? Since if you know what Z in two is, you can find the gamma uh, You can find the gamma 
at uh, at one, the point one would be equal to gamma at point one would be z zero one um, z zero one minus z in two over z zero one plus z in two. Okay, that is the formula that we have for reflection coefficient. I think I have it reversed. The sign is reversed. It should be minus like this, okay? So that when z into is zero, which is a short, then I should have a minus one. There's a sanity check you can use. That is, if I do have a z into that is zero, the reflection coefficient should be minus one. So I know that this thing has to go this way. It's plus of something, uh, minus of two terms divided by the sum of two terms, okay? So once you are able to find gamma at this point, okay, then I can find using this formula again, okay, but be careful that this is not the Z in one that I had in the previous picture, okay? This was for a different picture. Let me draw a line here. This is for the above figure, but now if I were to use this bottom figure and apply z in one, and then it should be equal to um, I guess it should be equal to this one. Okay, z zero one. Uh, I guess the same formula applies, one plus gamma, one minus gamma, except that your gamma is given by this formula. So you can find the input impedance over here. And this can be the reflection coefficient at this point, at uh, that location. And you can think of this two, let me draw this properly. Uh, that this actually is a consideration of a transmission line that start out with this. And then you have another transmission line that looks like this. And then you have the third transmission line that's infinitely long. Okay, so this goes to infinity. And you can think of, this is the picture you have started out with. And then this is L2, this is L1. And then you have, this is your junction one. And this is your zero, Z01, zero Z02. Zero and then you are going to replace this part uh, with this uh, ZL2. Looking this way, you're gonna see a load called ZL2. So you, re you have replaced the top figure with the bottom figure and making it easier for you to find the reflection coefficient. Are there any questions so far regarding the procedure of finding the input impedance of a multi-junction transmission line? Okay, I can repeat this. What you need to do is actually starting out with this picture. Uh, once you know the load that you see over here, you know the reflection coefficient here. Okay, you know the reflection coefficient at this point. And once you know the reflection coefficient at this point, you can apply this formula uh, to get the input, input impedance at any point at this transmission line and finally at this junction over here. Okay. And then you can apply this to other kinds of lines where you have more than one junction. And in that case, you work recursively backward. You first have a two junction transmission line. You replace the last part here with CL. And then you use the formula to work out the input impedance at Z in two, okay, which is this formula over here. And then you recursively work backward. And finally, finding the reflection coefficient at this point and so on. And you can work that backward to find the input impedance at uh, location one, okay? So 
it is quite straightforward. And you can generalize this concept to multi-junction transmission lines. Okay, multi-junction transmission lines such as this one. Um, so what you can do is that if you have a load impedance here, you can work backward to find the impedance at this point. Okay, there is a formula for that because once you know the impedance at this point, you can find the reflection coefficient over there. And then if you want to find the imp impedance at that point, uh, it would be, let me call it Z in two, would be Z03 using the formula that I have, one plus gamma Z over one minus gamma Z. I can use this formula. Let me write this properly. I can find gamma L. Once I know gamma L, I can find gamma Z quite easily. Okay, gamma Z is just given by Let me write properly. Gamma Z is given by gamma L e to the 2J beta Z, okay? And then if you say that this point is Z equals minus L3, then this gamma Z becomes something like uh, gamma L e to the minus two J beta L three. Okay, and the beta you have to be careful. It has to be the beta of the transmission line that you're working with. So I better put a three here. Okay, so the beta three would be omega square root of L three C three. Okay, that is the beta that we have. Uh, found the formula for beta is given by that. And you have to use the corresponding line capacitance in line inductance to find the correct beta. So you work this beta out and then you can find the Z in at this point. Okay, once you know the Z in at this point, you can find the reflection coefficient at this point. Okay, the reflection coefficient at that point uh, would be given by gamma two, three tilde would be equal to um, Z in two minus Z zero two over Z in two plus Z zero two, okay? And I have to use the correct characteristic impedance for this line, okay? And Z in two is the impedance Sorry, it should be Z in three. Okay, in the picture I label Z in three. So I should put in a Z in three here. Okay, so you can find this using that. And once you have done that, then you can recursively work backward. And then you can find the impedance at this point. Okay, and then move it backward and find the reflection to a coefficient gamma one, two at this point and so on, and it work backward. So when you have a multi-junction transmission line, uh, that is how things go, okay? But it might be interesting to ask what the formula is for gamma one, two. Okay, gamma one, two, uh, how does it look like? Well, you can think of gamma one, two tilde has been equal to uh, C in two. Just take an example of this, okay? It's very important that you recognize what characteristic impedance to use, okay? Since you are performing the measurement using this transmission line, you're gonna send a wave in and look for the reflection coefficient that is coming back at you. So the characteristic impedance that you should use here should be Z01.
Don't get confused and say that when you want to find a reflection coefficient at this point over here, use Z02, that's wrong. Because I'm going to do the experiment by sending a wave inward and look for, looking for the reflected wave. And that ratio of the reflected wave to the incident wave has the reflection coefficient called gamma one, two tilde. And that uh, reflection coefficient is given by this formula over here, okay? And then uh, you can see that Z into, okay, Z into can again be written as, as we have done previously, can be written as uh, Z02, one plus gamma over one minus gamma, okay? Once you know the reflection coefficient at this point, you can also write Z into, in terms of the reflection coefficient that you have on this line, which is called a generalized reflection coefficient, in terms of the characteristic impedance of that line, okay? This would be something more like a gamma Z kind of thing. A generalized reflection coefficient that is a function of z, okay, and then uh, and then if you want to express gamma z, gamma z would have the value of gamma two three at this junction, okay. So I can plug this in here and get a rather complicated formula. And if I plug this in here, I would have something like uh, z zero two one plus gamma, one minus gamma, minus Z zero one over Z zero two, one plus gamma, one minus gamma, plus Z zero one. Okay, so, so you can see that um, this formula gets rather complicated and you can actually work this out you can multiply this out. It's uh, quite a bit of algebra. Okay, if you work this out, it will be Z02, one plus gamma minus Z01, one minus gamma over Z02, one plus gamma plus Z01, one minus gamma. Okay. The algebra is kind of complicated. Gamma, you know, is the generalized reflection coefficient. Okay, gamma at Z equals minus L2. Okay, I think I use L2, yeah. Is equal to gamma. Uh, gamma two, three. The reflection coefficient E to the minus two J beta two. L2. Okay, so this gamma that you have here would be dependent on the reflection coefficient that you have this junction multiplied by this phase as you change your location. So you can figure out what gamma should be. And then you can work out the details, which I wouldn't work out, is actually done in the lecture notes. Okay, it's done in the lecture notes. Um, I won't go through the algebra, but what it says is that if you go through the algebra properly, you can show that gamma one, two tilde is gamma one, two plus gamma over one plus gamma one, two gamma, okay? Just imagine that you have Z zero, one, Z zero, two. You can group them and rearrange them and get gamma one, two out. Okay, gamma one, two is what I call the local reflection coefficient is Z zero one minus Z zero two over Z zero one plus Z zero two. Okay, again, I have the sign reverse because what I should have is that if Z zero two is equal to zero, I should have a negative sign. Okay, so you can work out your gamma one, two, which I call the local reflection coefficient.
This is the reflection coefficient if you have two transmission lines. And the first one is Z01. The second one is Z02. And if you send in the wave, and the reflected wave will have a reflection coefficient of gamma 1, 2 at that junction. Okay, I will call it the local reflection coefficient. Whereas gamma here is a generalized reflection coefficient. And you plug it in here, uh, you get a rather complicated formula, uh, which I can write down. I don't have space to write. Let me insert a new slide. Okay, so if I write down gamma one, two tilde now, uh, it will look something like this. Okay, gamma one, two tilde is equal to gamma one, two plus gamma two, three, uh, which is the reflection coefficient at the second junction, e to the minus two j beta two. The betas are very important. You have to use beta depending on which transmission line the wave is traveling on. Okay, so you have to plug in the correct beta, the wave number of the wave that is in the transmission line that it is traveling on. And so you can actually write this formula in this way. So gamma one, two theodor can be written in terms of this. And then gamma two, three theodor can also be written recursively. Okay, gamma two, three theodor then would be equal to gamma two, three, the reflection coefficient at this junction gamma two, three, which is the local one, not the generalized one, okay? And then you will have, remember this first reflection coefficient is always the local reflection coefficient because that's what the formula worked out to be if you do it very carefully. And then the reflection coefficient at the load n, e to the minus two j beta three, L3 over one plus gamma two three, gamma L3 e to the minus two j beta three L3. So you have this way of recursively working out the reflection coefficients first at this end, first at this end using this formula. So this formula is a very powerful formula because it allows you to relate the reflection coefficient at the one two junction with that of the reflection coefficient at the two, three junction. This is a generalized reflection coefficient. Okay. Whereas the gamma one, two are the local reflection coefficient, assuming that you have two infinite lines concatenated together. Okay. So, so this idea is pretty straightforward. You can always write a program to do this, which means that uh, no matter how complicated the transmission line is, you can find the generalized reflection coefficient recursively using this formula. And that is how the fabry perot uh, resonator works. You can actually model a multi-layer structure, which is called the fabry perot resonator. You can think of this as very much like a multi-junction transmission line problem. You can make it homomorphic to the multi-junction transmission line problem. And then you can find the reflection coefficient of this structure using transmission line model. And you can recursively work the reflection coefficient backward and study uh, this thing quite effectively. And So you can do things like this in microwave engineering, where you have a transmission line, where you can model with a simple transmission line model. You might have these complicated junctions and things at these junctions are not that simple and they are not text 
book problem. In order to find a solution to these junctions and solving Maxwell's equations with respect to them, you have to use numerical methods. Before that, we just did experiments. If you want to find the effects of this junction, we did experiments. But now computers are so powerful, we can solve Maxwell's equations on a computer because they're just PDEs, partial differential equations. If you're good with numerical methods, you can solve Maxwell's equation for a complicated geometry like this and figure out what the reflection coefficients are. And then the next thing you do then is to find a simplifying model for a microwave integrated circuit that looks like this. You can put in simple models. And here, here are more examples of microstrip line wave guides that are very popular in microwave engineering. Here is the mimicry of a transmission line. As long as you have two conductors, a ground and a signal line, this forms what is called a transmission line approximately. And you can use this to guide signal. And this is another mimicry of a transmission line. You have a signal line and a ground line. Or it could be that one is positive signal, the other one is negative signal uh, with respect to the ground. And this pair of metal can form a waveguide or a transmission line waveguide. Okay. But when you have a junction like this, such as this, what happens is that there'll be charge build up and charge accumulation. And sometimes there'll be large current flow due to the constriction of the current at this junction. And they are too difficult to study you, uh, analytically in textbooks. So what you can do, however, is to approximate the physics that happens at those junctions with the capacitor that accounts for the charge storage. And then inductors that accounts for the fact that you may have strong magnetic field build up due to the narrowing of the lines or the constriction of the current flow. And also because when you have a bend such as this, okay, there'll be charge accumulation at the junction. And you can approximately model them with what we call the stray capacitance and the stray inductance. And you can use this to model your transmission line junction. Okay, are there any questions so far? Any questions? If not, let's move on to duality principle. Duality principle is something that exploits the symmetry of Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations are highly symmetrical and we have studied them before. And we say that when you have Faraday's law, okay, you can write them in the frequency domain in this manner. And then when you have Ampere's law, we can also write it in the frequency domain in this manner. But usually we have an electric current here in the frequency domain or in the phasor wall. And then we have divergence of D, uh, R, omega equals to the charge in the system, the electric charge in the system, uh, which is a function of R and omega. And then we have divergence of B, R of omega, which is usually zero, okay? So this makes Maxwell's equations asymmetric because we only found electric current sources and also electric charges. The mathematicians, like to make Maxwell's equations more symmetrical by introducing fictitious. Um, professor? Yes? Uh, sorry to interrupt. The second second equation curl of H on the right-hand side should be J omega D, right? Oh yeah, you're correct. Okay, this should be plus. Thanks for catching that. Thank you. Who, who was that who was speaking? Uh, Zhang Liu. Okay, thank you, Zhang Liu. Uh, because when I'm in the presentation mode, I cannot see your faces that well. <laughs> so, so this would be a fictitious magnetic current. And then there will be a fictitious electric current. And in addition, we can also introduce fictitious magnetic charges. 
And by so doing, we can actually make the Maxwell's equations very, very symmetrical. We can call this electric charge to distinguish it from magnetic charge. And you can see that once you have this Maxwell's equation, you can do swapping. And if you do the swapping that if you replace E with H, H with minus E, and then D with B, and then B with minus D, okay? You can see that uh, the equations preserve some kind of a symmetry, but if you further make the swap that whenever I see an M I replace with a J, and then whenever I see a J, I replace it with the M. Okay, this should be a minus J here. And then whenever I see a magnetic charges, I replace it with an electric charge. Okay, and whenever I see electric charge, I replace it with magnetic charge. Let me check my lecture notes to see if I have this swapping rules correctly identified. Okay, uh, it should actually be this. Uh, Correct rule is V to minus D, rho M to minus rho E, and rho E to rho M. So if you do the swap in your head, okay, replace E with H, and then B with minus D, okay, M with minus J, the first equation becomes the second equation. And then if you go to the second equation, do the same swap, replace H with minus E, D with B, and then J with M, you get back the first equation, okay? And you go to the third equation, you do the same thing, D with B, and then uh, D with B, and then, and then row E with row M, okay? You get the last equation. And then you go to the last equation and replace B with minus D, okay? And row M with row E, you get back the third equation. Okay, so these are the swapping that preserve Maxwell's equations, which means that if you have found a set of solutions to Maxwell's equations, you can do this swapping. And after you have done the swapping, then the solution is still the solution to Maxwell's equations, okay? And if you have material properties, uh, you have to be careful then uh, if you have like D, is equal to epsilon dot E for an isotropic medium. And then you have B is equal to mu dot H. That would be a kind of an isotropic medium. And what you need to do is that whenever you have material, you also have to swap the material. The mu becomes epsilon. And then epsilon becomes mu. If you do this swap, as you swap the field, then Maxwell's equations are preserved. Okay, are there any questions regarding this? Okay, the, the, you might wonder why we have this very strange swapping. Well, we pick this swapping so that the right-hand rule is preserved. For instance, uh, if you were to, let me give you an example of preserving right-hand rule. Say if I have a medium, let's just take back here. I have a plane wave, E, and then H, and this plane wave E and H have to be orthogonal to each other. And then the K vector has to be something like this. This is called the K vector. Or uh, in the optics, it's called K, but in microwave engineering, sometimes it's called a beta vector, okay? And if you look at a swap, we will replace E with H, H with minus E, okay? 
Uh, so E with H, H with minus E. So if you do the swapping, then this will become H. And the H has to be replaced with minus E. Okay, so this is minus E. You can see that E cross H has to be proportional to K, the direction of propagation of the wave. And we pick this sign so that if you look at E cross H, okay, E cross H, E actually is pointing that way because of the minus sign. E cross H is still pointing in the, in the K direction, okay? So this swapping preserves right-hand rule. Uh, right hand rule. We call this right hand rule in electromagnetics because E cross H points in the K direction. And you can actually look at all the other things. Right hand rule is preserved for a plane wave. But Maxwell's equations is so symmetrical that you can have other kinds of swaps. And those other kinds of swaps do not preserve the right hand rule, but they do preserve the solutions to Maxwell's equations. Okay, I talk a lot about that in the lecture notes. I call them unusual swap. Okay, I, I'm not going to talk about those here. Okay, right hand rule not preserved. Because uh, there is a very hot topic of research now, which is that um, if you were if you were to have a material replaced with minus mu naught and an epsilon naught replaced with minus epsilon naught, you find that. Well, if that is the case, then the k vector need not point in this direction, in this medium. Okay, Maxwell's equations is still preserved. You can go back and check, even if you do this swap to Maxwell's equation. Uh, it's been preserved. However, the right-hand rule is not preserved. And this is what is called a left-handed material because you will see that E points in that direction H points in that direction, but the wave actually propagates in this direction for this wave. This is called a left-handed material. And sometimes it's called the double negative material. It has a lot of name, double negative material. Okay, I, I didn't write material very well. And then, uh, and then sometimes they're called metamaterials. Because you can engineer materials that have negative mu and negative epsilon, like you see for the case of a plasma medium, you can actually make epsilon negative. And if you work hard enough, you can also engineer some materials where mu is also negative. Then you have this very weird behavior of the wave. The wave seems to be traveling backward in time if we look at them in the time domain. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this, but if you're interested, you can read about them. Uh, maybe you won't feel so bad if you hear about them in uh, talks at conferences and you, you know what double negative materials are, what left-handed materials are, and it has something to do with this uh, swapping rule. Another thing that we should be mindful of is the fact that uh, when you have an electric dipole, electric field looks something like this, okay? But we never have magnetic current because we do not have magnetic charges in this world. However, we can mimic a magnetic dipole quite easily using an electric current loop. If you have an electric current loop, which is shown here, okay, then, what happens is that you can go through Ampere's law using the right-hand rule for Ampere's law. If you have an electric current flowing like this, 
then the magnetic field has to go something like this. And if you look at the magnetic field of an electric current loop, they look like the electric field of an electric dipole. So you can think of an electric current loop as something resembling the magnetic dipole. So even though you cannot make magnetic charges, you can think of an electric current loop as the, due to the fact that you have two magnetic charges of opposite polarity, they will produce the same field as is seen in this diagram, okay? So even though magnetic currents do not exist, they can be engineered. Another place where you see magnetic current being engineered is in the toroidal antenna. This is called the uh, toroidal antenna. I, I think I have, uh, let me see if, I get the spelling right, toroid. You know what a toroid is? Okay. So what you have is that if you have some high mu material, like ferrite or something, if you make a loop around this ferrite material and pass current through that, uh, you know that uh, it will produce polarized magnetic current in this loop. And that polarized magnetic current, which actually due to, is due to magnetic dipoles, can act as if it is a magnetic current loop, and then it will produce electric field that looks something like this. And that electric field would drive the current on the cylinder of a dipole antenna, for instance. And because of that, uh, you can cause currents to flow on this line. There's one way to look at it, but another way to look at it is to think of this as a transformer. You probably have learned about transformer in your undergraduate course, okay? If I connect a wire like this, then what you have is actually the primary winding of a transformer, and the cylinder forms the secondary winding of the transformer. If you pass electric current into the primary winding, you will produce a voltage on the secondary winding. This actually has been used to drive huge antennas. This antenna can be huge and at very low frequency, this is actually a very good device. And in the oil exploration industry, uh, let me see where did my slide go. In the oil exploration industry, they would like to put this huge dipole antenna into the earth, okay? Because the earth is very lossy, one way to get electromagnetic signal to the earth is to use very low frequency electromagnetic field. And this huge dipole would produce that um, low frequency electromagnetic uh, field needed. And this is called a mode two. I think if you Google mode two, you might be able to find this uh, information on this tool where you use a cylinder okay, to carry the signal uh, out. And a cylinder actually is also a waveguide. That waveguide we call the Gu Bao Lan. Because if you have just a piece of wire, you can think of the piece of wire uh, like very much like the inner conductor Okay, let me see. So if you have a coaxial cable, we know that coaxial cable carries a mode, a transmission line mode on this coaxial cable. And now imagine that the radius of the coax cable becomes larger and larger. Okay, the electric field looks something like this. And if you're just a piece of wire in air, then it will carry a mode that looks like the mode of a coaxial cable. And the mode will have electric field that looks something like this. This is called the Gubao mode. And it can be used to carry signals along a piece of wire. Though not as efficiently as a coax cable because it's open, 
is subject to interference, uh, but it has been used anyhow in the oil industry and so on. Uh, the last thing I'd like to mention is that the next lecture we will talk about uh, reflection coefficient of the electromagnetic field at a single interface. And what you find is that once you have solved this problem using Maxwell's equations, the dual problem is just this one. You replace E with H, H with minus E and so on. So you solve this problem for the single interface reflection problem, you find the reflection coefficient. You go through a lot of hard work and algebra to find a solution. But then the solution to the second problem can be just inferred using duality principle. Are there any questions uh, before we stop? Any, anybody here has any question? If not, I'll let you go then since my time is up. Okay, have a good day. Uh, take good care of yourself. Stay safe. And don't go and have wild parties. It's not good for safety. Okay, stay safe and be good. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Bye bye.